This episode of The Casual is brought to you in part by Squarespace. For all your website needs, Squarespace delivers it in an all-around package to help you build a beautiful, integrated online presence. For many people out there, owning a fashion label is a dream career. And for many more, a street label is even more so. Not only do you get to own something that all the young people like, but you can possibly live like your favorite entertainers without actually being an entertainer. Sounds fantastic. The reality is building a fashion brand over time is incredibly difficult. For every Supreme, for which there is only one, there's a Fat Farm or Benny Gold that totally makes owning a label terrible. Today we take a look at some of those that fell off and what exactly happened. I'm Reggie Casual and these are seven fashion labels that went from hot to damn. What happened? What happened? Let's get it. Coming up first on our list is Von Dutch. Now Von Dutch is a very complicated case and way too convoluted to go super deep into in the small little list like this. But Von Dutch clothing was founded in 1999 and run by Michael Castle and Robert Vaughn. And there are more controversies here because Vaughn caught a murder case. Yeah, it's, it's crazy like that. If you really wanna know the whole story, there's like a whole Hulu doc spelling out this entire issue. As you might have guessed, these issues caught up with the once ubiquitous label because along with Ed Hardy, Von Dutch was the Y2K look. The brand's distinctive designs, which often featured the Von Dutch logo and graphics, became a hallmark of the early 2000s fashion scene. And that trucker cap, yeah, that was every damn wear. At the time, the brand was also criticized for its controversial use of the Von Dutch name and the way it appropriated the culture of the custom motorcycle scene without necessarily honoring its roots, with some critics arguing that the brand was capitalizing on the work of Kenny Howard, the artist and mechanic who originally created the Von Dutch designs. But nobody cared about that because it was hot, like billion dollar hot. But it all came crashing down once questionable legal issues arised, various ownership lawsuits ensued, and a litany of less than favorable business practices became all too apparent. But the nail in the coffin was when it finally came out that Kenny Howard, the original Von Dutch designer and mechanic, the aforementioned, if you will, who died well before the inception of the Von Dutch brand, may have been as close to a neo-Nazi without actually being a neo-Nazi as you could possibly be with some sources who were close to Howard even saying he was a documented racist and couldn't stand being around black people. Now, I'm not one to dabble in gossip, but that kind of news could hurt any brand if it was true or not. So I don't wanna go into it because that's not what we talking about now. Seriously, I'm oversimplifying it. If you wanna know the whole story, I suggest watching the Hulu documentary that spells a lot of all of these issues out. And while the brand still exists and produces clothing items, it's under different management now, it's owned by a totally different company. Its influence on the fashion scene, however, is significantly diminished. Although some are pointing to a comeback. And all I'm saying is you may want to research the brand before you hit yourself to that wagon. You want to go it? Go ahead and hit yourself to that wagon and see how you feel. Yo, we going, you know, change the idea of it. Yeah, no. No, Von, the Von Dutch designs were done by the guy, right? So you, <laughs> you're not gonna get away from it. <laughs> and in my mind, I'm thinking about it. I was like, yo, somebody who, who's really about that life, who's really about that neo nazi life, yeah, they're probably just cracking up. Like they're like, at least, even if, even if it isn't true, the fact that you could be is more than enough. I mean, I, but hey, go ahead. Von Dutch making a comeback, baby. On to the next one. Number two, Echo Unlimited, founded by Mark Echo in 1993. Now in the early 2000s, Echo Unlimited was at the height of its popularity. The brand's distinctive designs, which often feature graffiti-inspired graphics and bold logos, and that damn Rhino logo, seriously, it was everywhere. It was worn by a wide range of celebrities, athletes, including 50 Cent, LeBron James and Justin Timberlake. The brand also expanded to include a range of accessories and fragrances, further cementing its position in the fashion world. But why fragrances though? No, nobody knows, just, you know, you wanna smell good and, you know, echo fragrance. Yeah, that, that's where it's at. 
However, as the fashion industry began to shift towards minimalist and more understated designs, Echo Unlimited struggled to keep up. The brand's bold and flashy designs began to feel out of touch with the evolving taste of consumers and sales began to decline. The brand also faced competition from other street brands such as Supreme and Stussy, which were able to adapt to changing trends and maintain their relevance. In response to these challenges, Echo Unlimited attempted to reinvent itself with mixed results. The brand launched several new lines, including a women's collection and a line of designer watches, but these efforts failed to generate significant buzz. In 2013, the brand was sold to Iconics Brand Group, a licensing company that specializes in acquiring and managing fashion brands. Mark Echo called it a day. He's like, I'm done and started Complex Magazine, which was a far, far better and more successful venture. And then he sold that. And, th and then he sold that and became a very, very wealthy guy. So smart, really smart. Number three, or Samba Me, FUBU. FUBU, or as the culture knows it by, for us, by us, dog. <laughs> which is, if you think about it, straight bold. I don't know if it's out of pocket, but it's bold. But it worked. Founded by Damon John and his colleagues, FUBU's one of those success stories that can't be gone over in a simple list like this. It had global success and took For Us By Us to a whole new level. Despite its popularity, particularly among Black Americans, athletes, and entertainers, FUBU made two grave mistakes. One, it never quite kept up with changing tastes in fashion. Until this day, and I love him, but Damon John has a low-key disdain for the fashion industry, likely due to his experience with FUBU. He constantly tells people that starting a fashion brand is a huge mistake and not even worth the investment, even though he himself took the risk. He also low-key threw young people under the bus when talking about FUBU's rebranding saying young people have like a three second attention span, so he's not worried about the rebranding. I'm paraphrasing, but he said something like that. Two, and the real reason, they bought too much stock. And as a result, the clothes that ended up in retailers went on discount bins and outlets. And once you get there as a brand, once you're in the discount, it's almost impossible to get out. It just looks like your brand is irrelevant. So the brand went through several different acquisitions until Damon John was able to buy it back with the plan to reinvent it. I mean, that's still in discussion. Nobody knows what's gonna happen, but it's still around, it's still there, but I don't know how many people actually care. Number four, LRG, LRG Lifted Research Group, founded by Jonas Bivakwa. I, mean, I wanna get his name wrong because it's really serious. Bivakwa and Robert Wright in 1999. Known for its bold designs and skateboarder meets hip hop aesthetic, which honestly was damn cool. Till this day, LRG is still dope. I'm sorry, but not sorry. I mean, the original concept, golden. Despite its early successes though, the brand faced multiple challenges related to changes in consumer preferences, financial difficulties, and internal management issues. It seems like this is kind of a reoccurring theme. If you don't know how to manage your business, the likelihood that you'll have struggles is high. So it's not all about like the clothes. Sometimes it's about the actual business. I mean, who am I? But what do I know? What do I, I just keep on telling you the same thing. These are the struggles. Anyway, back to LRG. And one of the main struggles for LRG was keeping up with evolving trends. Like I said before, the brand's aesthetic is rooted in streetwear and the hip hop culture of the late 1990s and early 2000s. However, fashion trends are constantly changing. You know that, and LRG has struggled to keep up with the pace of that change. In 2015, LRG filed for bankruptcy and was subsequently acquired by Mad Engine LLC, a company that specializes in licensed apparel. Now, all of this was likely due to the unfortunate passing of the brand's co-founder, Jonas Bavakwa, in 2011, which left a leadership vacuum that was difficult to fill. Since then, the brand has undergone several management changes. Despite these struggles, LRG has continued to release new collections and collaborate with other brands and artists. The brand has also tried to stay relevant by expanding its product offerings beyond street to include more traditional fashion items like jackets, button-down shirts, and chinos. But to say it's still culturally relevant would be a bit of a reach. Now we got three more on the list, but before that, a word from our sponsor, Squarespace.
A big part of fashion is community, and building a fashion brand or any business requires a strong one. That's why using Squarespace for your new website might be the way to go. Besides being packed with great website templates, built-in SEO and analytics, Squarespace's new members areas make it easy to create, foster, and grow a community of true fans. Give back by giving members exclusive content, discounts, and much more all while monetizing your business. So use our code squarespace.com slash the casual to save 10% off of your first website and let Squarespace help you build your brand, business, and community. Coming down to number three, Kuji. Kuji is a special case because one, it isn't necessarily a street brand, but was adopted by street styles. And two, it has had some renewed interests in recent years. That said, the Australian brand, that's right, Australian. Kuji is Australian, don't get it twisted. Despite being from Australia, Kuji gained a huge following as it was adopted by high profile rappers like Notorious B.I.G. Despite that, in 2009, the brand would file for bankruptcy all due to mismanagement. It was acquired by a private equity firm. Yeah, it's all big business talk and way too complicated for now, but a big reason Kuji proper went out of favor was because it expanded its product line to include everything from home decor to watches, which diluted the brand's identity and made it difficult for consumers to understand what the brand stood for. It also didn't help that people kept calling the sweaters Cosby sweaters when they were certainly not the sweater Cosby was wearing on his now infamous television show. That was another brand entirely, but it didn't stop people from calling Kuji sweaters Cosby sweaters. Number two, you know we gotta put a Japanese one on this list, Ivizu, founded in 1991 by Hidehiko Yamane. Ivizu was part of the Osaka Five, a group of denim brands that helped shape Japanese denim culture. So it has some chops, some heritage chops to be sure. Known for its high quality denim and its signature seagull logo, Ivizu gained popularity in the 1990s and early 2000s and was worn by celebrities and fashion enthusiasts around the world. And at one point was spoken in the same breath as Bape. That's right. In fact, Ivizu denim with the Bape camo hoodie was at one point the uniform of the high profile fashion head who only got stuff from Japan. Now, one of the main challenges for Ivizu denim has been changes in consumer taste. The brand's focus on high-end denim and traditional Japanese craftsmanship struggled to keep up with the fast paced fashion industry. As a result, Ivizu denim struggled to remain relevant. It also refused to go skinny when everyone was Eddie Slimon in it up for a few years. Thus, Ivizu Denim faced financial difficulties and went through multiple ownership changes and has faced bankruptcy several times over the years. Now in 2017, the company Itochu acquired Ivizu Denim and attempted to reposition it as a luxury brand with a focus on high-end denim and Japanese craftsmanship. As a result, the brand Ivizu Denim has shown some signs of recovery and has released new collections and collaborations. And its signature seagull logo remains a recognizable symbol of Japanese denim. So it's still around, but far from those glory days. And our number one on this list, N Noir, in black, is actually a tragic tale of gaining hype way too soon, spending way too much money to build a high-end clientele list and being ahead of the curve by about two or three years. Let me explain. Founded by Robert Garcia, Noir was one of the first high-end street fashion brands that specialized in luxury leather clothing for men, at least out west. And it debuted in 2012 during New York Fashion Week. That's right, a relatively newcomer to the game debuted at New York Fashion Week. Crazy, right? But Robert Garcia had the backing of Mega, the owner of Blackscale, because Robert was like the creative head or he had a position there. He was a creative designer there. But see, the problem was Robert was still a self-taught designer and gained all his marketing chops from working in the street space, where it's a whole hell of a lot cheaper to produce pieces and popularity is predicated on hype almost solely on hype. And designer fashion doesn't always need super hype. It needs dedicated loyalists to build brand foundation. And of course, En Noir at the beginning was anything but cheap to produce. And to get the word out, Robert gifted celebs like Kanye West, Jay-Z, Rihanna, and Pharrell initial pieces. And predictably, it blew up as far as popularity. But in only three years from the time of its inception to 2015 to be exact, the brand shut things down. When Robert Garcia actually announced that Enoir was taking a hiatus, he cited difficulties in managing the brand's growth 
and production, which is just crazy to think about. It would turn up a few years later, but minus the premium materials and minus the hype, of course. Seriously, it turned into like Rago hats and tees and later ditched the entire black motif to keep up with trends. But it just goes to show that even with celebrity endorsements, it doesn't spell success if you can't manage your finances. And it's a damn shame, but Rob still gets plenty of work. I'm sure he's become a pretty well-known designer in certain circles, so he's fine, but dropping the ball. I mean, just a missed opportunity. And it's just sad. It's, it's sad to think about it. So those are seven street or street adjacent labels that went from hot to damn what happened to you. Uh, perhaps a designer label episode is in the works. Maybe we should do that. But how about some more from you? What are some other labels you feel fell off a cliff? They were just like, damn, it's no disrespect. Just like, yo, what happened? And I wanna know what happened to this brand because it was hot for a while and now it just, it disappeared or at least it's there, but I don't see anybody wearing that junk, man. Like why, how are they still in business? Or you can suggest another list that we can cover. But most importantly, keep it locked right here for all of your info in international fashion, culture, and business from Tokyo. This, it's your boy and keep it casual. Yoroshiku onegaishimasu. And I will see you guys in a minute. じゃあ、今日はここまでです。That was fun. <laughs>